One of the more difficult questions for us to navigate as a society, as a collective, as a community, is the question of elective pronouns. When a person chooses a, let's say, non-binary or non-exclusive or a atypical pronoun for themselves to be referred to, should we as a society accept, affirm, reject? What should we do with that? And our society has struggled with it immensely, um, trying to file it in different socioeconomic value assessment boxes, and it doesn't really fit anywhere in them yet. We haven't figured out what we're doing with it. Honestly, it is so new, so original to our generation that we really don't know what we're doing with it. We're just trying stuff, quite frankly. We don't know. And this is especially difficult for the church, which has been divided on social and political economic terms for m generations now, obviously, has been heavily divided as well. We don't know what we're doing. We're really struggling to figure out what to do here, there, and everywhere about this specific issue. And so, as a result, in order to appeal to a greater authority on the matter, often these different variable sects, factions of Christianity, appeal to Jesus being on their side. They want Jesus to be wearing their jersey in this issue for obvious reasons, obviously, right? If Jesus would do it, we should do it too. That's the basic rationale. The question is, what would Jesus do, right, to appeal to an older kind of cultural paradigm? What would Jesus do about this issue? What would Jesus choose to do if someone has elective pronouns and demanded that he use them, would he do that for them? That's the question. Would Jesus respect, honor, um, whatever, their pronoun? That's the question. And I've been doing some research, not only about obviously Jesus, like reading scripture, but also some cultural um, type maximal stuff in that, that what would Jesus do with pronouns? And I think I have come to the conclusion, the answer is Jesus would not use them. And I have a lot of variable kind of criteria with which that I've made that conclusion, or I've come to that conclusion. First is what a person is doing when they are demanding us to affirm, respect, or honor their pronouns, their elective pronouns, they are making an honorific demand. If you don't understand what that means, that in a society where cultural collective honor is an extremely valuable currency to make an honorific demand of someone is an extremely valuable form of currency to kind of maybe coerce at times them to do whatever it is that you want them to do but also it's extremely valuable currency with which to do transactional business. When you hear someone say, I give you my word, they're making an honorific demand as well, right? And so the closest thing in our society to this is actually not within our society. That you have to cross borders into the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, in order to really see this functioning. If you've seen the movie Encanto, like that's kind of the backdrop that's happening there as well. That in a very niche community, 
one in which there is no strong federalized or centralized governmental presence to mediate disagreements and enforced contracts that society relies back on individual duty and honor within the collective. For example, feudal Japan, think about the Samurai's Bushido Code, or in Europe, the, chiv uh, the chivalrous code of honor, or the Wild West. You'd have the sheriff with the golden or brass badge, and then you have everyone else who just kind of operate on the honor system, the honor code, right? I'm going to borrow this, and I'm going to return it. Everything survives on the basis of how it serves the community health as a whole. That when you have a small village, let's say a small Wild West mining town, a few hundred people, if a person has a cattle farm and one of their animals strays to another person's property, it is better for that person to keep the animal individualistically, right? I just got a new animal, finders keepers. However, that's bad for the society because it sows distrust and it causes a blood debt, an honorific debt to the other individual that must now be resolved in like kind. You are going to keep my animal, then the next time one of yours strays onto my property, I'm going to keep it. This creates a hostile and negative basis in society where people begin to interact with one another. It makes it more and more toxic, unhealthy, and dangerous. However, if I choose to return your animal to you, even though it wouldn't be beneficial for me to keep it, it would and you're my competitor in the environment, it would be, it's not good for me to give it back to you because that gives you an additional asset, right? And quite frankly, I don't care about you at all, but it's good for our society, our community. It benefits from me freely offering the animal back to you because now we are back on even terms again. You are not above me, and I am not below you. You are not below me, I am not above you. We are equal this way. Also, in a small community like that, everyone serves a very specific, valuable contribution to society by their form of labor. Let's say I'm a farrier, and I have a, a specific plot of land that I live on your animal strays onto my land, I want you to have that animal because when it comes to shoeing your horses, if you've got a whole uh, herd of horses, one of them strays onto my land, I want you to have that horse because I want to shoe it later. I want you to pay me to shoe it later. So I want you to have it. I want you to have more assets on the basis of the more assets you have, the more work I will have to do right? This is not socialist, it's socialization. It's, um, we are working for each other's benefit collectively. I also want you to have more animals because those animals eventually come to slaughter. Those things get put into the butchery or into the grocery store or the, the general store, and then I will have access to that resource that way. I want the society to benefit because I benefit when the society benefits. This is the logic that is often used to argue for pro-choice uh, or for pro-life um, and for um, even the, the whole welfare and health care kind of stuff that society benefits. We all benefit. Raising the minimum wage, we all benefit. Like It, it gets twisted in a lot of ways, but... When you're in an honorific culture, all of that makes sense. Here's the issue. The West 
United States of America, modern post-industrial, industrial, modern and post-modern United States of America is not honorific. It's not an honor-based culture that in small pockets, like let's say with my friends, I might say, I give you my word, and then that word is valuable to that one person because they know me. Similarly to how you write checks, right? Your name is in the upper left corner. You sign it in the lower right corner. My name is on it, guaranteeing this monetary transfer. But you're still going to ask to see my ID to make sure that it matches if you're doing your job, right? the more familiar a cashier happens to be with me, they may not ask for my ID because they know who I am, right? My name is a, attached to it. There's some minor kind of sprinkling of honorific culture underneath ours. When you're talking about in rap or in urban settings with a diss track where 50 Cent and Jay-Z are going back, MGK and Eminem and so forth, they are having an honorific battle between one another on their reputation, right? And the critical link here is that the, um, the debts of honor in a society are not resolved by, let's say, the government. Their honor, they are decided by the court of public opinion. The federal government, like for instance, the President of the United States never weighed in on who had the better diss track between MGK and Eminem. Their fans did. They decided who won that battle. And in a similar way, in society, if there's an honorific debt between two people, it is the community that decides the resolution to that debt. Another example would be Hamilton. Aaron Burr wins the duel, kills Alexander Hamilton, but the court of public opinion has decided he lost the honorific exchange there, even though he won the duel. Court of public opinion decides. And when we are in a society here, that, like I said, we are not an honorific society to begin with, but we are divided on this issue. The court of public opinion has not made a resolution, a judgment call, a discernment about the issue of pronouns. Because that court of public opinion has not resolved it, the honorific debt persists. So if I don't use someone's pronouns that they have elected, that small little group that I'm in, they may be upset, but they don't necessarily represent mass culture, right? That's why the idea of cancellation is a big deal. They may kick you off of Twitter. They may kick you off of YouTube. They may expunge you from that culture Right, Because they've made the resolution that they want, but that doesn't necessarily reflect the larger culture. Because honestly, one of the things that keeps the United States from being an honorific culture is that it's just too big. It is gigantic, especially compare and contrast to ancient cultures where entire nations were not as large as the United States individual states would have been that the entire empire of the Romans or the of Alexander the Great are only a little bit bigger than the United States of America. And in fact, if you take the Mediterranean Sea out and you just count surfaced land acquired, they're almost the same size and the United States in some instances is actually bigger than the greatest empires of the world and it's impossible in many ways to rule a large expansive empire or continent or world or uh, nation that is that 
does that big. You can't do it. That's why the Jews during the time of Christ had so much autonomy and why it was such a big deal that certain states or certain cities like Corinth or Thessalonica were independent or that they were colonies or that they were official Roman states and things like that's why it was such a big deal to have those kinds of uh, labels when the uh, Sadducees are crucifying Jesus they say if you don't do this you are no longer a friend of Caesar that's an actual title that's a certification um, that that's like how that's a resume point that a person ruling over a region would need to have in order to do so effectively they're making a very stark precise claim there and so that's another thing that it's the united states is just too big like you can't even compare what it's like to live south central la versus uh i mean central brooklyn or downtown manhattan or these kind of things like it's impossible to compare them and then in like urban rap there was a huge disparity right a huge point of contention in rap culture over you're from atlanta you are from memphis you're from okc you're from where like in dallas and different like you're from those places that's your culture of this specific niche that's and then additionally like that's why there's so many various kind of denominations in christianity as well that you're scottish Pre presbyterian or you are elca or you are these things because the larger something becomes the more ungovernor governor a bill it becomes in that expanse and the more it becomes inherent and necessary for honor to preside and adhese these different people together in a specific small, let's say, church group. That's why you go to this church and that church down the corner, there's going to be a little bit of opposition, adversity between them, friction maybe, because they are in every way subculturally distinct honorifically distinct from one another but generally as an entire nation state the united states is not an honor culture and so if you are actually to roll back a clock and try to make this pronouns argument let's say a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago in a more honorific based culture like south american aztecs or the southeast asian different peoples of let's say uh the bushido of japan and i say i am not a she i am a they refer to me as a they on their honor in their culture they would never attempt to disgrace their village and their community by referring to you incorrectly and this is especially poignant in different areas where like in Chinese there's Mandarin and there's Cantonese. So if you refer to someone in a specific language in a specific way, you have to do so because if you refer to them in the other, then the the sound you make might be the same, but what it means is very different. So this is important that we live in a very different culture than then. And so if Jesus was to be born into uh, the West in the United States of America being not in a broad spectrum honorific culture would mean that he would not step outside to try and cash a check essentially in society with a currency not many people respect value are willing to trans transact with being honor he would use culturally relevant currencies it's almost the same as asking someone if Jesus was alive today in the flesh, would he use dollar bills or would he use Caesarian gold or would he use Bitcoin? Well, he'd use the most relevant, accessible, transactable currency available 
in order to do daily business. That's that's the answer. And honor in society is an intangible currency in that exact same way. That like with your friends, if you think about it, I'll do for you, and then later down the road, you're going to have an opportunity, and then you can do back for me. Like we, most of our friendships kind of operate that way. I'll get you this time, next time you can get me, and I'll buy your coffee or meals or whatever. When we keep a subtle tally in the back of our mind of, they've gotten me coffee three times this week, I need to take them out for lunch. I need to get their lunch today because we have to keep this balance. We do have a some, we understand this in a very, very minute, microcosmic manner, not broad spectrum. It doesn't work like that uh, in the same way of that, quite frankly, I personally don't have a great regard for people that live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. That city may have been in the news a lot over the last couple of years, never met anyone that I'm aware of from there. Therefore, news from there, headlines from there, don't affect me. I don't really care. I have the theological thing. It's like, I know the church lived, there's, there's churches there that are suffering. There's people there. You can make generalizations. There's people there that matter. Yes. Intrinsically, yes. But they're not part of my community and I don't care. I, I don't really. And I might throw a couple of dollars into the plate for a ministry or some kind of outreach or something to help rebuild broken down, burned out stores there. I might do that because of generalizations that are true about them. They're human, Americans, uh, so forth. But... If one of them was to knock on my door right now, I probably wouldn't answer. Or I wouldn't let them in because they're not known to me. That's how honor works. That's how it functions in a broad spe like that the same way a, when you hear the conflicts that are occurring in the gospel narratives between Jews and Gentiles between slaves and masters, between men and women, between adults and children, between Jews and Samaritans, you're hearing that exact same thing. That the idea that they would go around the long way to avoid Samaria. They're doing this very thing of, I don't care about them. They're not of us. That's a very, and you can say, well, that's cruel. But then you're showing, again, you are exposing yourself of that you have a value contrary to what they valued. And let's go beyond this. Begs the question, Jesus went straight to Samaria. He didn't go the long way around. He went to Sychar. And he sat on the, what, the woman, with the woman at the well, right? He did that. He would defy that cultural mark. Uh, Marquis, therefore, he would defy this one too. And the answer actually to that is no. He defied certain superficial, traditional Marquis. He did do that, going to Samaritan, uh, the Samaritan city of Sychar. And also doing things like, um, also doing things like uh, his... Uh, the contest over divorce and things like that where he's or the Sermon on the Mount where he's saying you've heard it said but I say like he defied certain superficial traditions but he always did it in a manner that transacted with the cultural currency of honor he every time and you see it in the circumstance of the woman at the well with where she's saying, you're a Jew, right? Which is a reference that you worship on in Jerusalem, but we worship here. He's appealing to his honor as a descendant and a, of the family of King David. She's appealing to that. And then she says, but Jacob dug us this well. 
she's appealing to her deeper honor that Jacob is an ancestor of David. That's what he's that's what she's appealing to. That you appeal to David, and that's here. I'm appealing to Jacob, which is up here. That's that's honorific uh, demands. And then that's it, it's an attempt to put him, despite his elevated rank in society, he's a he's a man, she's a woman. He's elevated above her in society. He's basically she's trying to even the odds. He then goes, "Where's your husband?" I don't have a husband showing honesty and integrity. And he says, that's right. You have had five husbands and you've had four husbands and the man you are married with right now, he's not your husband, which lowers her in society. Remember, she's there at the well during the day. That's an honor statement as well. She's avoiding shame in her society by doing something when no one else is doing it, no one else will see her doing it. Another example of this is Nicodemus. Nicodemus is an elder in the community. Men like that, men in general, but men like that did not go out at night. There's numerous reasons for this. Going out at night makes you at risk of encountering bandits and things, like obviously evil rules the night, puts you at risk. And then men, as soon as the sun begins to set, they go home, they bar the door, they eat with their families, they clean them, like the mess gets cleaned up by them or their servants or their, their children. They bar the door and then they all go to bed as soon, like when the oil runs out or whatever for the lamps, they all go to bed together at night. Men did not go out at night in that culture. So by doing so, going to Jesus, John chapter 3, what he's doing is avoiding shame by going to Jesus, by him going to Jesus is an avoidance of having been at debt. He's recognizing Jesus as being actually culturally elevated above him. Like, if you go to someone, like, for instance, I would go to a judge. A judge doesn't come to me. I go to the president. The president doesn't come to me. So Nicodemus coming in, he's recognizing an inferiority in society to Jesus. He even says this, we know that you're from God because of the sign works that you do. So he's going at night to save face so that he can have an honest face-to-face -face conversation with this man he sees as superior without costing himself in the public eye and so there's numerous other examples of this that I can go into so many but I'll, I'll just cut it there the major issue that Jesus would not engage in this manner would not recognize honor someone's pronouns the main reason is that simply we don't traffic in that kind of currency in our society we don't he wouldn't there wouldn't be an obligation to do so his compassion now we have a different conversation but he wouldn't be required to is what i'm saying there wouldn't be an obligation to do so